Good afternoon from Browns Valley for another segment of the Food and Farm Show. I'm Gil Dominguez. Today we are at the future of farming and ranching in the Sierra foothills. And this is a program being put on by the University of California Sierra Foothill Research and Extension Center. And there's going to be a lot of great information that's going to be disseminated here today. We have a, a group of 50 or 60 farmers that are in attendance. And uh, we'll be hearing uh, from our guest speaker, our keynote speaker of the day is uh, Jamie Johansson, who's the second vice president of the California Farm Bureau. And he'll have some great information. A local farmer himself from the Oroville area. Also on the speaking list is Dan Macon from Flying Mule Farm. And he'll be talking about business planning essentials for farmers because there is a business side to the farm as well. Paul Glowowski from Dinner Bell Farms in Chicago Park is also going to be speaking and you'll really enjoy his subject uh, that he's talking about and he's really big on research and record keeping and how that really helps him make uh, determinations on his farm. Uh, Sue Hook is going to be identifying physical resources needed and of course she's a fourth generation rancher from Nevada County specializing in beef production. So we have a lot of things to do today here on the Food and Farm show. We're glad you're with us. When we come back after the break, we'll be listening to Jamie Johansson from the California State Farm Bureau. You're watching the Food and Farm Show. Nevada County Farm Supply has been part of the agricultural scene since 1993. Their staff consists of a certified crop advisor, licensed pest control advisor, and irrigation auditor. In Penn Valley, they have a full-service nursery with over 500 varieties of plants and garden enhancements. In Grass Valley, they have a warehouse full of soil amendments, fertilizers, and nutrients. Nevada County Farm Supply. Powerful knowledge and innovative solutions. Anything Green Hydroponics is your source for hydro systems, grow lights, and soils. Anything Green offers a complete range of organic nutrients as well as fungicides, miticides, and predatory bugs. Anything Green Hydroponics has just received this year's soil. Get your totes, pallets, or individual bags. Stay tuned for future workshops. It's all at Anything Green Hydroponics. Welcome back to the Food and Farm Show. Time to go inside the conference now and meet Madison Easley, who's coordinating this great event here from the Sierra Foothill and Research Extension Center, which is a 5,000 acre farm here in Browns Valley, just a stone's throw away from Nevada County. And then also we'll be introduced to Jamie Johansson from the Farm Bureau. Well, welcome to the Sierra Foothill Research and Extension Center. We are one of nine of these centers throughout the state of California, and we're under the University of California Ag and Natural Resources Division. And we'll go into more detail on our field tour later today in a couple hours and give you some background about why we're here and what we do. Um, but I'd like to introduce our event to you and give you some background information as to why we're hosting this event. So there were three goals we had initially when we started this event. First, we wanted to help contribute to the many efforts that are currently existing through UCCE, Farm Bureau, Local Food Coalition, all these different local ag groups. We wanted to help contribute to that, an event that would unify local people interested in agriculture and bring them to a central cause that we all believed in. Secondly, we think there's inherent and intrinsic value in packaging information from those who have the knowledge and experience to those who are about to enter the field of farming and ranching because it's a difficult um, occupation and it's really important that we utilize the experience and knowledge that is already out there and let future agriculturalists gain that information. And then third, we wanted to heighten the awareness of local agriculture and um, bring together people from the region and offer exhibits and things so people could get more information. Uh, I realized that agriculturalists across the state are in a dire situation due to this drought, but one of our 
positive outlooks about this event was that we should celebrate all the success and all the triumphs of local agriculture. Although we are in extremely tough times, it's also important to look at the positive things that have happened from local agriculture and the positive things that there are for future agriculturalists. We have a great day planned. If you have your agenda in front of you, I'd like to walk through it with you and just explain what the day is about. So we will be starting with a very important person who is the second vice president of the California Farm Bureau. His name is Jamie Johansson. And he will be giving us a statewide perspective of the future of agriculture. And then we'll move into our first topic of the day, which is about getting started. And Dan Macon will introduce this theme, who is a specialist in the UC Cooperative Extension and has tremendous amount of knowledge. And then we'll discuss business planning, implementation, and resources um, in the morning session before we go on a field tour. And for the field tour, in order to make it as efficient as possible, we'll need to utilize people with large vehicles and people will have to share and uh, we'll ha anyone who has to use the restroom at that point, there's restrooms straight across in this office building and then also down here in the corner of this shop. So um, if you have to excuse yourself at any time, that's where the restrooms are. Um, but for this field tour, it's really important that we congregate together and um, get into vehicles so we can go around and Jeremy James, the center director, and Dustin um, Flavel, our superintendent, will tell us more about the center and how its role in the community and agriculture. And then we'll come back for a delicious lunch help provided by North Yuba Grown and SF Rec. And then our afternoon session will be about maintaining and expanding and how to stay in agriculture or in farming and ranching. And then um, finally, Jeremy James will sum up the day and we will have some excellent student presentations because these are individuals who are just starting their careers and their pathways in agriculture and they are really bright and have some awesome things to share. And we will conclude the day with a social where you will be able to interact with the speakers and all those that you've heard from throughout the day. And we'll have some goodies at the end. So um, yeah, be sure to stick around. And I'm really looking forward to all this awesome information and great uh, tools and skills that we will be learning about. And with that, I'd like to introduce the second vice president of the California Farm Bureau, who is also the owner of Lodestar Farms, um, which is a quality olive oil farm in Oroville. And help me in welcoming Mr. Jamie Johansson. Well, thanks. Um, it's great to be here because you usually get these assignments and the, the president, Paul Wanger, who farms in Stanislaus and Kenny Watkins, who farms in San Joaquin County or down in San Diego. So it's nice to only be a half hour away from my farm. Um, uh, we farm in Oroville up in the foothills there. So I have some experience farming in the foothills. And I know when they contacted me and they said, well, let's talk about, I want you to talk about the, fu the future of farming and ranching uh, in the foothills. I, over and over, I couldn't get around one word, and that's rocks. And I think that is going to be our future for a long time, forever and ever. It's just rocks. You keep growing them. And i got huge piles uh, you can come around the farm and see. I actually, um, uh, really quick, just to give you a background of Farm Beer, if you're not familiar, statewide organization, we're the largest. We have about... 30,000 members, um, and we started in conjunction with UC Extension. So when they create, the government, the United States government in early 1900s said, excuse me, if I get over this cold, <clears throat> um, actually I was going to bring my water, Elisa, can you get me? Um, they said, it, we'll start putting, you, we'll put Extension offices wherever you start a farm group. If you can get a bunch of farmers around to, um, to talk, or to get together and have more guys, we'll put UC Extension Advisors in your, in your county to help you do the research, to get the stuff from the big thinkers at the big universities, to get it down at the ground level. And that's how UC Extension started, and that's how Farm Bureau started. So happy birthday to UC Extension, who's doing 100 years, 100 years today, or this year is their 100th anniversary. Placer County Farm Bureau celebrates their 100th this year, so it's fun to be a part of a research institute that makes a difference for all farmers. 
I am a first generation farmer. I started in 1993. I didn't have an ag education background. My education came through UC Extension. So when we talk about UC Extension, it is my alma mater, I feel like. And I came up here in the 90s. I wanted to be a cattle rancher, quickly realized that I'd never have enough land. Olive oil started taking off. I had 20 acres of olives, and that's the direction, the direction I went. But coming up here in the 90s, the big issue then was uh, star thistle. So we were trying to learn how to, uh, to live with star thistle or how to eradicate it. The beekeepers had a great idea, and that's making a specialty product with rare and endangered star thistle honey, which made all the ranchers laugh, but they got a premium uh, in their marketplace. But, um, but really, olive oil, too, and there's a rise of it. When I started, there was 10 of us. Now there's over 200 different labels. We're not so uh, specialized anymore. But really, that was UC Extension that really kicked that off over in Sonoma, Paul Vossen, and all of that. So UC Extension, if you're, if you're a beginning farmer, I've kind of written this for beginning farmers, or these guys who've been around 20 years like myself, um, this talk to encourage you, uh, UC Extension is probably the most valuable tool that we have as beginning farmers, first generation, and really fifth generation farmers. Um, and it's no easy task in today's budgetary climate to, uh, to keep a thriving UC Extension around. So thank you for being here and continue to support them wherever you can. And showing up here, the numbers that we have here is great because that makes a difference in Sacramento it makes a difference in D.C. when they decide to allocate funds and that people really appreciate what UC Extension is doing. But to get into it, I want to talk barely about the reality of um, small-scale farming and what it has meant uh, for me and what it will mean for you uh, as you either redevelop your farm or you take over from your parents and figure out we've got to do different things to survive in this climate, or even if you're here deciding if you want to start farming. I mean, the reality is this as a small farmer. You are not alone. I think too often we think, wow, I'm doing this thing alone. Over half the farms uh, in California are only between the acres of 1 to 49 acres. Half the farms in California. They have the new numbers coming out. The USDA census came out yesterday, part of it. And the average size of farm in California is 20 acres. How does USDA determine what a farm is? Arguable if the number is a little low, but if you're selling $1,000 or more off your farm, off your land, you're considered a farm. That basically is if you're selling five dozen... Uh, five dozen eggs, chicken eggs a week at five dollars a piece for the whole entire year, you're considered a farm by the USDA. But the bottom line is this, you're not alone in, um, uh, as a small farmer. You are not outnumbered. You outnumber the larger farms, however you think what large is. But between one to 49 acres is the average, is, is half the farms in California. And basically this too, no one is out there to shut you down. You have more resources now than ever to keep you in business. I'd probably say the only one out there ready to shut you down, that would be the government, but I'll leave my politics out of it for, for at least the first 10 minutes. But uh, uh, you have a lot of people on your side. And I'll tell you, when I started my farm, it's a funny little industry when I started. I could have gone anywhere, and people ask, what do you want to do uh, when you grow up, or what do you want to do when you're done with college? You could say, I want to be a brain surgeon. I want to be a professional football player. I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a, a nuclear scientist. And what does everyone do? Pat you on the back. That's a great goal. You tell someone you want to farm, are you crazy? You're not going to do that, especially within the industry. So I've learned, too, that my first advice to you is that when you go around to these events and farming events and stuff like this, I learned this really quickly because it would get discouraging. It was like, you can't do it. You can't make it work. And now remember, olive oil, was pretty, there wasn't a whole bunch of us, like I said, 10 of us doing it then. Um, I learned really quickly is that when you get, when you get the negative people uh, in agriculture, uh, the first thing I would say to them is, are you selling? Because I'm buying if it's so bad. And then you get the whole different idea. Oh, I'm not selling. Well, hey, isn't it so bad? But I, I do want to talk. We need to, we need to talk, um, frankly, about the reality of being a small farmer. And there are some cold, hard facts. And it is a business. And it's difficult to make money at. In fact, one in three um, farm families work two or more jobs, uh, depending on off-farm income for their survival. So you're probably not going to be a full-time farmer. You're going to have to have an outside job if you're farming in the foothills. That's just, that's just the reality of today and the way, the way it goes, unless you're really innovative. And then you better keep innovative because other people are going to copy it. Like I said, there was 10 of us in olive oil. Now there's over 200 different labels. It gets pretty competitive pretty quick. Um, and the biggest thing I get in olive oil when I started in one of the first, I, get a, I used to get a lot of phone calls from people who wanted to start olive oil companies or start farming olives. And then more often than not, no offense, but the reality of it is this, is that if you're semi-retired or retired, they would call up. 
we're retiring from the Bay Area, we're coming up to Oroville, because land is way more affordable in Oroville than it is in glamorous spots like Napa and Sonoma. And uh, we want to buy an olive orchard and start an olive oil company. And, you know, we're semi-retired or we're re retired And my first message back to them is, you are not retired anymore. <laughs> that is just a cold hard... You, you, you are going to work harder and longer than you ever have before. And basically, if you start your company and selling what you grow, you really aren't going to farm as much as you think you are. When I was selling, I started out as fortunate. I worked in construction, uh, building custom homes. Uh, and while I was starting my farm and learning how to farm, I turned over the land, who's now my labor contractor, and said, here, we did a 25-75 split. I said, I'll pay for the water. You just give me 25% of whatever you can get for these olives. And, uh, but I said, I want, I want answers to all my questions. I want to learn how to do this. I'm going to be your mentor. And it, and it worked out great. But I quickly realized is that um, I wasn't going to make a whole lot of money anymore selling to the canneries. There used to be uh, 16 different uh, black olive uh, canneries in California doing black right process. A lot of competition for olives. Uh, in the mid-90s, that shrunk from 16 down to 2. So consolidation is... is um, is a major uh, obstacle to overcome in agriculture. And I said, you know, to save this farm, to keep doing what I'm doing, I need to start marketing everything that I grow. A secondary market, like maybe selling bulk olives is one thing, and selling a little of the cannery. But when I started that, I, I, I started doing less of what I really enjoyed, and that's farming. But that's just the reality of it, because what are we doing to survive on the farm in the foothills to create income? In the farmer's markets, getting the trucks ready, you know, right now, Saturday, Farmer's Market should be there. I have a, a, a friend that helps me out. They're up there in Chico right now. Web orders. Smartest thing I ever did right now, start your website. Just get something up there. You may have Facebook. You may have Twitter. Great. Just get a web address up there. 25% of all our sales are, are done online. Um, but your packaging, you're updating your website, which is more money out the door for doing all that. Um, your marketing, all the special events. And also the paperwork. The paperwork that... I don't care what size you are, you're going to be doing a lot of paperwork. And, uh, uh, and that takes away from what our passion is and what, we, what we're trying to preserve for our families, and, and that is farming. The long-term cold hard facts is that small farms, like any other small business, uh, has a relatively high exit rate, 9 to 10% a year uh, of, of small farms will go out of business. And basically, a lot of times, too, it's not that they're going broke, it's that there's an easier way to make money. And, and people probably realize, you know what? A lot better to get a stable, stable check every two weeks than it is dependent on the cash flow and everything like that. But for small farms, that's a reality. Um, and also this, and we all have dreams. I have a six-year-old, two boys, six and uh, three, and a little girl who is two years old. And we all dream about the next generation and been passing something on and creating a legacy. Uh, but I want you as a small farmers to appreciate that when you run into... Farm claims have been around for a while when someone drops a third, fourth, and fifth generation on you. It's, it's noble. It is, it is risky. It is cutting edge to start your farm. After 20 years and being in the California Farm Bureau and traveling around, that is an amazing feat to get the third, fourth, and fifth generation. Because I will tell you, 90% of the farms in, in America will not get past the third generation. That means in three generations' time, there's a 90% turnover in farms. Whether that goes to a, you know, whether they consolidate another farm, buys them out, or something like that. But that is an amazing feat. That's a difficulty of, of, of the legacy that you're trying to create. But I do want to, on a positive note, and that's the cold, hard reality. And remember what I said. The way you handle naysayers is say, well, if it's so bad, um, I'll be happy to buy you out. And then they quickly will reverse it. So, but, uh, you know, I want to recognize, too, that there is a drought going on right now. And it's critical. I mean, everyone in agriculture is going to learn something new this year. I don't care if you've been farming four or five generations because we have never seen this level. Just the other day, Glen Cluse Irrigation District um, just announced to their growers that they're going to get 40% allocation. What's significant about that is that that is the lowest they've ever got. By contract, they're required to get 75%. That was the lowest they were ever allocated. And that is um, the last time they got that low of an allocation, 75%, was in uh, 1977. So this drought, we have never seen anything like this come, come through California. But the drought aside, I want to say this. And so I, I don't want you to think I'm not thinking about the drought, but there has never been a better time to start a small, a small farm in the Sierra foothills. There are simply markets and consumer, and consumer developments that has occurred that simply didn't exist 20 years ago. What you can do now 
on a farming in the foothills you really couldn't have done 20 years ago. And truthfully, one of the great jobs, I get to meet a lot of different people. And truthfully, I don't care if you farm 50,000 acres or 80 acres like myself. Um, you did not have the advantages that you enjoy today. I got to meet a group, group of growers who were coming through. About, there's about six of them, and these are the largest farmers in America. They go, to, they, they go around wine and dine themselves, but they're friends. And they are family farms. They are all family-owned. These aren't CEOs. These guys are the farmers. The smallest guy there farmed 20,000 acres in Minnesota, and the largest guy there signed, uh, farmed 50,000 acres on the border of Mississippi and Georgia and had a dairy and everything like that. And they wanted to come and they wanted to talk about California, the reality of farming in California and the regulations we've got to face and everything like that. It was interesting, we were sitting there at a dinner, and they were buying dinner because it was a high-end steakhouse in San Francisco, which will always get me to make the two-and-a-half-hour drive to San Francisco. But uh, here are these large farmers, and they asked me, they said, what do you think about the farm bill? Like the farm bill. You know, this is, this is kind of surreal. I farm 80 acres. You know, other than with Farm Bureau and stuff like that, and I won't go into the farm bill, I really... You have the largest farmers in America asking you what you think about the farm bill. I was like, I need to ask you guys. You know, everyone has this perception that's geared towards big farmers. But it got me thinking. And it, it, we started talking more about what was in it for us, research. I will tell you this, the farm bill is important to you. Um, when you look at the, the investment of ag research, if you look at half the CDFA budget, it comes from the federal government. Another, the other 40% really is funded by us in the industry. About 10, 7% comes from the general fund. Um, uh, uh, it's important to us. But when I talked to them the next morning, they wanted to go to breakfast, and I asked them, and I said, who here, who here can honestly say that they could, they could be where they're at, these, all these large farmers, could you be doing what you're doing, farming 50,000 acres 20 years ago? And every single one of them said no. I farm 80 acres. Could I be doing what I'm doing today 20 years ago? When I, I couldn't, no, no way. And that's based on equipment needs, the large farmers, a lot of development equipment, a lot for me, communication capabilities, and most importantly, the consumer spending habits. 20 years ago, those all did not exist that we have today. The consumer, uh, uh, the consumer spending habits, the consumers right now, like no time before, really are rooting for you guys. The consumers are interested in what you're doing. Because the further removed we are generationally, um, from agriculture, and now we have third, fourth, fifth generations. Used to be everyone had a grandparent that was in agriculture or, or, or a relative that was in agriculture. Um, the further removed we are as a society from agriculture, the easier it is to romanticize it. I remember I started my farm in 93, and my grandfather immigrated from a farm in Sweden, which I got to go visit. If you come to our tasting room, I have a picture over the cash register of the, of the farm uh, that my great aunt uh, uh, um, uh, painted. And he could point to the room where my grandfather was born. And he never really talked about it. And when I come to find out, he left pretty, during some pretty hard times in Sweden in the 20s uh, and got tired of watching his family starve on the farm while his dad fed the rest of the neighborhood. But he didn't really talk about it much until he was about, he was about 95. And he never, got, he never really comprehended he was in Denver when we moved him out uh, to Oroville. I remember him sitting down and he said, tell me about this farming thing. And, you know, for a Swede, olives, you can't get it much further away from the olive industry than Sweden. <laughs> And uh, he was always convinced I was farming potatoes, so he, was, he always referred to them as potatoes, which you know, that's probably what he grew. But he said a telling thing, and we talk about the romanticizing of small farms and farming. He looked at me, and it is kind of, it's hard not to get emotional, but it, it hit me. He said, you know, he goes, I left Sweden so my kids and grandkids didn't have to farm, so that we could make a better life for them. So kind of come in full circle, but that's the romanticizing that we have now with the consumers, which is to our advantage. And I'll get into some disadvantages of that as well. Um, I just want to look at my time. Um, uh, you know, we look at the farmer's markets and the rise of the farmer's markets. And I do about, in the height of the season, about four or five farmer's markets a week. Uh, I can tell you, if you do a farmer's market, and no one here from, a, a, well, I'm not going to say the name because now there's a camera right there. But if you go to, if you go to an actual small farming town to a farmer's market, as opposed to doing a Chico market or maybe a Grass Valley market, the response is much different. When you are in a small farming town doing a farmer's market, they're not impressed. <laughs> they're all farmers. <laughs> they, all, they all know farmers. And so that romanticizing that the consumer has now in, an, in, in a growing urban population. My wife used to, when I do stores uh, in, in the Bay Area, we were in Adronico's first starting out, and she was, we were just dating. She, she was living in San Francisco, and I do the in-store tastings. 
and I do the tastings and talk about the farm and the stuff to hand out. She'd come in uh, and say, well, no one knows you're the farmer. She hand, she'd hand draw a sign that says, meet the farmer. I'm like, my gosh, that's embarrassing. I'm not, it's, like, it's like standing on a street corner with a cardboard sign. <laughs> And, you know, so we'd do it, you know, and then she would leave, and I would take it down. And all of a sudden, it would go back and forth. I'd put it back up, but I started realizing, like, wow, I'm selling more when I have that sign up there. And uh, um, uh, they want to meet you, like, at no other time, because they probably have never met someone. And even, you know, it, farming olives was unique back then. Um, the other thing, too, is I want to point out is that... Um, Consumers are so in love with you now. Anyone here do CSAs? Anyone here thinking about do, doing CSAs? To the point now that really, like no other time, the consumers are so in love with farmers, they're willing to let you tell them what they need to eat. Well, once again, we're out of time here on this episode of the Food and Farm Show. Thanks so much for joining in to part one of the future of farming and ranching in Sierra Foothills. Next week, we'll dive into part two. Our guest on that show will be Paul Glowowski from Dinner Bell Farms, as well as Sue Hook from the Robinson Ranch in Nevada County. For everybody here, thanks a lot for joining us. We'll see you next week on the Food and Farm Show. Nevada County Farm Supply has been part of the agricultural scene since 1993. Their staff consists of a certified crop advisor, licensed pest control advisor, and irrigation auditor. In Penn Valley, they have a full-service nursery with over 500 varieties of plants and garden enhancements. In Grass Valley, they have a warehouse full of soil amendments, fertilizers, and nutrients. Nevada County Farm Supply, powerful knowledge and innovative solutions. Anything Green Hydroponics is your source for hydro systems, grow lights, and soils. Anything Green offers a complete range of organic nutrients as well as fungicides, miticides, and predatory bugs. Anything Green Hydroponics has just received this year's soil. Get your totes, pallets, or individual bags. Stay tuned for future workshops. It's all at Anything Green Hydroponics.